I would now like to open the floor and uh, give the audience a chance to talk to this illustrious panel here. If you just uh, wave your arm really straight up in the air and, and prepare your questions so that we can get interactive here. Um, <coughs> there's a first one over here and then the second one, uh, Andrew, I think, right? The first one here in the, in the third row, I think. Could you wave your arm again so that the microphone can see you? It's Please introduce yourself and try to keep it, please, to one question, if possible. Okay. Uh, Ian Bond from the Centre for European Reform in London. Um, first of all, very quickly, I can't resist taking up the point on the Security Council. Uh, it is, at the end of the day, Russia and China which have been the most obstructive about Security Council <coughs> reform, not um, the UK and France. Anyway, be that as it may. My question is about the southern neighbourhood and a strategic approach from the EU and the US to the southern neighbourhood. Uh, in the years after the end of the Cold War, over three or four years, we gradually put together a, a policy of integration for Central Europe into both the EU and NATO. At the moment, we are still struggling for... Can you hear me all right? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Uh, at the moment, we're still struggling for a, a similarly strategic approach to the arc of countries from Morocco to Turkey perhaps even a little narrower than that, mm. let's say from Morocco to Egypt. So I'd be interested in any thoughts that the panel has on what our strategic approach should be to security and prosperity around the southern sides of the Mediterranean. Great. Thank you, Ian. I didn't recognize you at first. It's Andrew Michter, I think a couple of... Yeah, please. And then I take one more after that, so one here in the front. Thank you very much, Andrew Michta, Center for European Policy Analysis. Um, just wanted to pick up on one point that Minister Sikorsky uh, made about trends not needing to become outcomes. And we've gone through the gloom of statistics that we hear over and over again in various conferences like this. Um, I just want to remind everybody that a few years back, uh, Matt Simmons was predicting peak oil and prices were going to go up to 200, the barrel and all of that. And yet we have now a situation with technological change and uh, the energy revolution in the United States and in Europe and in Asia, I believe, coming up. That's just making a mockery of, of this. So I have a question to the panel. What are the drivers that are actually the unexpected ones that can change these trends and reverse the equation so that we can actually start talking about the positive trajectory that we can follow as a transatlantic community? What should we be focusing on that can actually undo these grand projections that we see 20, 30, 40 years ago and somehow prove to us that we have some gasoline in our tank. Thank you. That's the black swan question. Then we have one uh, gentleman here in the front row. Microphone is coming. Just one second. I'm Shokat Aziz, former Prime Minister of Pakistan. Steve Hadley started the discussion with the estimates of growth, etc., which were published recently by through the national intelligence estimates. I'm not a European, obviously, but I think uh, if you look 30 years down the road, there is no question that rebalancing is taking place in the world, in every field. And on the economic side, or GDP numbers, which you highlighted, Steve, clearly the weight is shifting. However, I would say that there is, this should not be a cause of concern. I think this is an opportunity for Europe and the United States. And what we must realize is that the US and Europe will still have three strategic weapons, not weapons, but strategic items in their pocket to influence their uh, clout or create clout in the world. Number one, most importantly, defense. And here, the United States I'm just coming from the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore, and we went through all this. Defense is where you have global defense. If there's need to move large number of uh, capacity across the world, the US has the best capability. I don't see that changing, but we'll see how it goes. Second, foreign direct investment. A lot of the growth happening in the emerging world, and I'm part of that, is driven by FDI from OECD countries. So that is a lever. Where you, where, which can be used to create the necessary influence which you may require. Third is trade. 
the emerging markets can produce as much as they want, but if the developed markets are not available, there will be issues. So despite all the trade treaties, etc., you have leverage in that case also. So my point is, use these as opportunities. Don't uh, view them as threats. Of course, this is easier said than done. But I thought I'd get some comments from you and your panel. Great. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. So we have the Southern Neighborhood question, one about unexpected factors and uh, the folly of linear projections, and one is rebalancing as a chance and the strength of the West. Um, who would like to go first on this, Mr. Squasby? <coughs> As regards the southern rim, um, the instruments of it, uh, and, and I think Europe will be largely left to deal with it, uh, with some um, help from the United States uh, uh, from, from behind, like in Libya, maybe now in Syria. But, but in, um, in trying to, to stabilize northern Africa, essentially, uh, we have actually very few instruments. But what we could do is apply the resources that we, we have much more politically. Because it seems to me that when we spend our European money, and we are a developmental superpower, we spend the biggest amount of money on, on um, development in the world, or in our humanitarian assistance, it's, it's either humanitarian or it's pseudo-Marxist, in the sense that let's pump some money, let's build roads, schools, hospitals, people get richer, then they become democratic and uh, more sophisticated, more like us. And I'm not sure it works like that. We should be much more unashamedly political in how we spend our money, in rewarding good behavior and punishing bad behavior. And the same in our trade policy. Um, the reason we don't have influence is that we engage in these multi-annual trade negotiations. So, you know, you have a revolution in Egypt we, or in Tunisia, you start a negotiation. Five, de five years down the road, you have a deal. In other three years, and you have a, a ratification and implementation. Everybody had already forgotten about how it originated. I would like Europe to grant privileges, one-sided. We can afford it. If we see a, a good government with a good plan and um, people with a mission um, uh, take power, we should do what the United States did for us, for example, in the early 1990s. Poland was hugely helped. Um, by uh, the creation of the Zloty Stabilization Fund with a billion dollars in it. We actually didn't then take it up. But the creation of it gave us confidence that we can do it. Uh, and then it was the, we actually have the, one of the managers of it, the uh, Polish-American, what was it called? Enterprise. <coughs> Enterprise Fund, which took stakes in emerging companies and actually, in the end, made money. <laughs> but do something uh, even small, but do it quickly and, 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 and let it act. It's in that spirit that Poland devised, uh, during our presidency of the EU, the European Endowment for Democracy. And I'm very glad that Germany has just pledged a contribution to it. So it's now, it's, um, we've given it 5 million. The total budget is 26 million euros. It's a good starting budget, and they can start working on the politics of these countries, um, which, which I think is speed is of the essence in these revolutionary situations. Can I, can I follow up just real quick before you continue? The European Union, in reacting to the Arab Spring, created a strategic Can you instrument. speak a little bit louder? I'm sorry, yes. I uh, don't know what the microphone is. Great. There is... In reaction to the Arab Spring, the European Union created for itself a toolbox, a strategic toolbox, um, markets, money, mobility, really big impact promises even that the European Union made. In the same spirit of generosity that you were just describing, it has not been used. Correct. So because it's impossible to use them. Because, no, frankly, I happen to, to, to have been living quite a long time in Egypt and et cetera. And I think that, frankly, uh, what it happened, it was not 
welcomed or even supported by the by US or the European capitals. Uh, it happened that people said, Halas, Kifaya, basta. We didn't want it, you didn't want it, but it happened. Uh, we were very well uh, used to, to, to deal with Ben Ali, with Mubarak, and, uh, and we were very well off with them. So we were not at the beginning, so the difference with the, the for instance, Eastern countries that Europe and the Americans had been promoting, let's say, the, the anti-communists, et cetera, et cetera, this, we were not in there as European. And we are not recognized by the youth and Arab there as a counterpart or, what, or a partner. Even worse, we are recognized as allies of older um, regime. And, and no, keep in mind the difference hmm, with the soft power of quote unquote credibility. We are not credible, we were the allies of the others. The second point is, uh, yes, there was a strategy, money, market, and... Uh, mobility. Mobility. Ma mobility. Mobility. Now, or money, or market. Now, what is the question there? First of all, the, the one of the most important tools uh, was enlargement for the Eastern country and so on, because, yes, the money was from the United States, but again, the dream, the goal was to rejoin the European family, the common values, and so on and so forth. We are almost there in the Balkans, almost, with still, you know, Albania and et cetera, et cetera. But anyhow, that is not the kinds of framework we have in the Southern Mediterranean, never. When Morocco asked to join the European Union, the king was left to the door. Turkey, we just mentioned what we have been doing. So first of all, we don't have a framework for the South Mediterranean. I had another difficulty. These countries don't talk to each other. Mm. They don't trade to each other. If you want to move from Cairo to Rabat, you better take a flight to Paris and then from Paris to Rabat because their thinking is very nationalistic and after the revolution, even more so. So we have to face this reality, and at the end of this thinking, my, my, my bottom line is that uh, we can have eventually an idea of a European strategy because geography is geography. But I'm not so sure that currently you can use the same policy uh, in Le Lebanon or, or in Egypt uh, uh, as you eventually could be useful to do it in Morocco. It's a totally different perspective and a totally different state. So we have to recognize that, that uh, the, 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 we lack, what do we want to see with this Southern European? An association, a free market, but free market, just to begin with, they don't, don't, don't trade the South-South. Uh, uh, so we have to face a double difficulties compared to what was the idea uh, of the Eastern, uh, Eastern Europe. This is uh, not because I'm projecting a solution, but if you even move a little bit forward, no? or the Mediterranean plus the Gulf state, plus you move at the other, that is a totally complicated and different. And maybe the, the, the thing that we can possibly push to this kind of uh, countries mm -hmm. is to try to better integrate each other and not vertically. Take water. Water is, uh, is something that, that could be uh, a war, can be uh, a sort of, uh, like it was for us, coal and uh, agriculture, right? Uh, energy. Uh, uh, Algeria has energy, Egypt doesn't have, but it has eventually the technology to gasify. But that is, uh, for the moment, out of any question. These people and these governments, for the moment, don't want to talk to each other. There is not even a rail, a rail, a rail, a rail. It's flat, huh? mm -hmm. the land is flat there, but there is no rail possibility from, from Alexandria to Benghazi or Tripoli. Mm -hmm. This has been the old problem of the Barcelona process from the beginning. <coughs> Jeska, you want to come in? That's why we dreamt of something that wasn't there. It never had worked. Huh? Because it the reality is worked. not there. Um, this was a, a strategy designed for the EU projected uh, to, the, to the southern coast of the Mediterranean and the Middle East, where the conditions were completely different. Therefore, 
it never has worked, the Barcelona process. It e immediately stopped with the uh, uh, Arab-Israeli conflict any time when uh, uh, I attended a, a meeting. And uh, um, I, I think uh, Minister Sikorsky has the right idea. I doubt uh, uh, that it will work uh, in, in the way as you propose. I will give you the example of Ukraine. Uh, Poland is, is extremely um, skilled and uh, experienced in dealing with the Ukraine. So your standard you propose, you wouldn't apply to the Ukraine because you know about the complexity, that this would be counterproductive, that there is another option, forces who would push the Ukraine immediately in that direction. So rightly so, uh, you are, and we had an interesting debate uh, two hours ago with a Polish representative uh, sitting on the, in the chair of uh, Steve Hadley, who uh, explained in a, in a very impressive way the, how Poland proposed to deal with the Ukraine, so more, more inclusive. Um, I, I think uh, uh, if you look to the uh, southern uh, uh, coast of the Mediterranean, uh, France or Italy or Spain would act immediately in the same way. So I don't believe that uh, it's very realistic. But the question uh, uh, which was raised um, I think um, there was a mistake. Turkey is a candidate. Turkey, you can't compare Turkey with others. Uh, with others. Turkey is a candidate. And uh, whether you like it or not, uh, this uh, creates a certain reality, also a certain legality. Uh, and uh, it, would be, it would be completely counterproductive to say from Morocco to Turkey. Turkey is a different issue, and uh, therefore it should also be discussed differently. I think in Turkey, the problem is when the EU is really investing in uh, uh, future membership of Turkey, whether it will materialize this or no, it must be done in a credible way. But the way we did it in the, since 2005, I think uh, contributed to the uh, present situation and is also, based on our in interest, counterproductive. The Middle East is different from Northern Africa. Um, I think one of the most important um, uh, policies e EU and US could do together uh, to think about how we can overcome, and this is the hell of a complication, how we can overcome uh, the de facto confrontation between the two neighbors, Morocco and Algeria. Because we could, if we could break up uh, that blockade, or this would change the situation, at least in the western part of yes. Northern Africa. Because if there would be the beginning of a cooperation, and uh, Western Sahara is playing into that, um, between Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco, uh, this could be a beginning for a stabilization process. Um, which uh, might be very interesting. And there, the US and uh, European foreign policy uh, should think about whether they can create a focus. This is not a short-term uh, initiative. It's, I think it needs some, uh, some patience and breath. But uh, without overcoming um, these um, cold confrontation between Morocco and Algeria, I think the whole Maghreb will not move. And if the Maghreb is not moving, Neither how can we other. expect that uh, uh, the eastern, uh, southeastern Mediterranean coast, <coughs> the countries there with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, unraveling Syria, and so on and so on, will move and the big question mark Egypt. So from that point of view, yeah. I would strongly recommend to focus on, uh, on the Maghreb. If you all allow, I would like to um, have at least two more questions from the audience, and then we do a final round and all of you can also address some of the leftovers from the earlier questions. I see, all right. Okay. Um, there's one gentleman right there in the center of it all, and then there's another one over there in the rear. And then maybe a third one wants to raise the arm. It's, oh, there's somebody waving all the way in the back. So we have three. The gentleman in the center, please. Uh, Rafał Jarocki. I'm uh, from a development company in Wrocław. And uh, I have a question. We have... Uh, as we know, we have uh, similar values in the Europe and United States, and we know about this. And we also know that uh, there are different values in uh, Asia and Middle East, and probably they will not merge in 
coming years. So I don't also think that we have the right to impose our values on the rest of the world. So I think we have somehow to accept them. But uh, on the other hand, we are very close to our, to our values. And I think we should uh, care to preserve them, at least in our part uh, of the world in which we are living. So I think that maybe a good step would be to create one country, United uh, Europe and uh, States, United States and, and Canada. And I think that this might be the way we should go. And if we look at, at this uh, in the very future, this development, I think it would be much easier for us to solve our problems and don't worry so much about our trade agreements, we could just solve it faster. Thinking big is always very much appreciated, I guess. <laughs> There's a, another person that was there, please. There's an arm up. Just one second, microphone is coming. If you could make that very uh, uh, up there. Can you raise your arm again so that the lady can see you? Yes, please. Make it a very short question, please. I'm Mateusz Matzini, professor professionally, College of Eastern Europe here in Wrocław, academically, University of Oxford. I've got a question to you, Minister Sikorski. There's a saying in English that a friend in need is a friend indeed. And there's no secret to any of us that the United States has always had a particular friend on this side of the Atlantic, meaning Great Britain. But recently, Great Britain might become a bit of a tricky partner rather than a friend, especially in the face of a possible exit of the government of David Cameron from the European Union. Do you think that there's still a possibility of having a European global strategy with a transatlantic perspective without Britain playing a central role? And if that is the case, what kind of role would Britain play in such a scenario? Thank you very much indeed. Excellent, thank you very much. And the final question over there. Thank you for, thank you for spotting me uh, at the very end. Uh, my name is Leszka Zdewski, I'm editor-in-chief of Liberté. Uh, when, you, uh, when a kid is living with, a, with the parents, it's very difficult to build an independent relationship in this kind of situation. And Europe is in a very unusual situation because it is the mother who is moving out. US is abandoning Europe. But it's a, it's a challenge, but it's an opportunity for building the mutual relations based on partnership, <laughs> not on de dependency. But to do this, uh, we would need uh, a visionary politicians who would be at the same time Machiavelli defining European reason of state, so to speak, and the, and the Bismarck uniting uh, divided European countries into one big power. And my question is to uh, Radoslav Sikorski and Joska Fischer here, who are politicians or former politicians. Where do you find kamikazes? Where do you find these politicians who would commit a suicide to uh, convince the, uh, their fellow uh, national citizens and fellow national politicians that they should abandon powers for the sake of the better good, for the sake of the future. Because this is going contrary to, we expect politicians <coughs> to act against their interests, to give up their national powers to create a European policy. Uh, so would you find powers in Europe that would, be, that would make it possible? Because I think everybody agrees agree what is needed, but it's very difficult to find political realistic uh, solution. Uh, that's, All right. that's what I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, values not impose, the UK questions, and the politicians or countries who sacri sacrifice themselves for the greater good. Mr. Sikorsky, I interrupted you earlier, so please. Uh, well, we, I feel we didn't answer uh, Professor Michta about, with his Rumsfeldian question about the known unknowns. Because the unknown unknowns, uh, by definition, we just... Uh, don't know about them. Um, but I think the, the known unknown is still the, not very original of me, but is the energy business. Because um, we can see some trends, but we don't know to what extent we will use the opportunities that present themselves. So for example, to what extent the United States will start uh, exporting LNG? <coughs> and how, how that will affect global L LNG markets and therefore also the revenues of um, energy producing states, which will have huge implications <laughs> on the ability of those states to act internationally. Um, um, we don't know how Germany <laughs> will deal with its um, 
energy challenge. Um, Germany is in a peculiarly <laughs> uh, influential position right. in Europe now because you adjusted your competitiveness in labor costs <laughs> 10 years ago. But I fear you're about to lose uh, your competitiveness in energy costs. And, um, and that would affect all of Germany's uh, neighbors uh, and, and, um, and Europe's competitiveness as a whole. Um, so I think this is still something that, w that has not work its worked itself through. You know, we have the capacity to make oil go down below 100 for good, and then interesting things will start happening also in, um, in the neighborhood of Europe, both southern and eastern. But I'm not sure we will act enough, fast enough, to, to, to actually make it happen. Um, one country, US and the EU, so uh, <coughs> under the EU constitution, under the US constitution perhaps, we were in search of a constitution, here's one that's worked for a while. Um, well, you'd have a very powerful uh, blocking um, um, minority in, in such an EU. Um, <clears throat> well. Uh, on the role for Britain, I, I felt that was the question for a British, um, uh, <laughs> British politician. I certainly hope uh, that um, the British will stay, and not only that, yes. that now that they face the possibility of leaving, they've actually examined the facts, and they are at last um, uh, fielding the arguments. And um, some of the latest pronouncement of Prime Minister Cameron are actually very helpful. You know, at last, British politicians are making the case for Europe and for Britain's uh, influence in Europe, which, which I think is a good departure. Um, and lastly, uh, the argument about uh, politi uh, national politicians being suici suicidal when they give up national power for the sake of Europe. I completely disagree, I have to tell you. Um, uh, remember, there is one area in which Poland, but also everybody else, completely gave up national sovereignty, which is the area of trade, of course. When we joined the EU, we had to abrogate trade, uh, trade agreements with third countries. And we are represented exclusively by the European Commission in trade negotiations. Terrible, loss of sovereignty. But the result, we get a much better deal when negotiating with the United States or Brazil or Russia or India than any single one of us, even Germany, yes. could get um, negotiating on their own. So this is where economies of scale work. Um, uh, I've mentioned this already. If the British imposed uh, uh, unilateral sanctions on Iran, would they work? No, they wouldn't. If uh, uh, Italy alone or France alone acted in Libya, could they succeed? Probably not. So actually the realization that, only, that you can only secure your national aims but by acting together with other Europeans is a good, um, is, is natural, it's obvious, and, and I just hope that the um, reality of it spreads to the public, because we now need to make a case for Europe. The day when we could do the right thing, make the communal, the, 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 the European deal in Brussels, and then come back home and bitch, bitch about Europe and, and, and claim how much we beggared our neighbors and, and served, ex served exclusively our, our national interest, those days should be over because um, we need to restore the faith in the community principle. Thank you. Steve, you want to come in on any of these? Sure, questions? let me just, uh, on a couple of them. Uh, on the issue of the unknown unknowns, look, one of the things we know about these studies looking 10, 20 years out right. is they're almost, right. they're almost always wrong. Uh, that's the good news. But the question is, do you want to just hope that they're wrong and sort of cast your fate to the winds? Or do you want to 
<laughs> do what you can to make them wrong. And I think the goal and the burden of policymakers is to do the latter. Hope, yes, pray, yes, but effort. And I think the formula is, is, is pretty clear. It is innovation from the private sector, which is in hugely important in getting the wherewithal to overcome these problems. It's sound policies out of our governments. And I would start with open trade, open investment, uh, uh, open capital flows. And it's then cooperation among the like-minded that share common values. Those are the tools we have, and I think we need to get after them. Secondly, I thought listening to the discussion, it's a very good case for why the UK should stay in Europe. Because if you look at the world that looks like it's emerging in 2013, you need leverage to preserve your interests in that world, and I don't see how the UK on its own is going to have much leverage. No, no it's not on its own. I think that their, their, their dream is to join the US. <laughs> okay. Uh, or we would, I'm okay. sure, consider an application from the UK to join oh, the yeah. United States of America, but I have a feeling it probably this would won't be get fun. submitted. Hmm? This um, would be fun if the former <laughs> colonial power would join the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> um, L lastly, I would just say, um, U.S. isn't going to abandon Europe, um, but I think it is important for the United States and Europe to think about ways they can be relevant to each other mm -hmm. and therefore strengthen the relationship because, as you could tell, I believe they are going to need each other if either of them is going to be able to maximize their influence in the new world that we face. And that is why I think it is so important for the United States and the Europe to undertake these common problems that are ambitious in scope, that solve some global problems, and will demonstrate to our respective populations the continued relevance importance, and importance of the relationship. That's what we need to be doing. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Joska. Well, first of all, uh, I, I totally agree what, uh, uh, to the words of uh, Minister Sikorsky and allow me to use the opportunity to congratulate you uh, a little bit late but to your great speech you gave in my country. I think this was uh, one of the most important speeches about the future of Europe and very courageous once again. Um, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, in energy issues I have a different view. What is bad with 100 and more? Um, uh, dollars uh, uh, for a, a barrel of oil. I mean, if I compare uh, the European, Asian, and American uh, experience, especially with the perspective of the car industry, high energy prices meant not a, a lack of competitiveness, but increased competitiveness by technological innovation. If you look to the problems of the American car industry, it's not only a lack of innovation, but it's also based on cheap energy prices, a technological lack of innovation compared to the Asians or the Europeans. So um, it, I, I don't want to open up this discussion, but I think it's nice for the US. I don't believe it's sustainable. If the world economy will get more bullish again, which we all hope, then I think we will see that recarbonization is not a future. Because on the other hand, the global trends you explained means that um, uh, 7 billion people, doubling of the middle class or even tripling of the middle class, with all the consumption, with all the same uh, uh, consumption patterns we used to have, means that we are crashing against the environmental wall. So from that point of view, I don't believe that uh, uh, the future of our economies, which will depend on high-end production in the US and in, in, in Europe, uh, compared to the other rising uh, economies, is um, uh, going back in the energy policy to the old days. It won't work. So I have there a very different view, but uh, at the end of a discussion, it makes no sense to go deeper into that uh, subject. Uh, I think uh, that... Uh, for Britain, it would be a disaster to leave the European Union. Uh, it would be um, very, uh, it would be a serious setback for the EU, but not a disaster. Um, but at the end, I hope that Britain will make up its mind, make up its mind, and British pragmatism and realism uh, will uh, have the upper hand. But at the end, it's their decision. I would deeply regret it 
but uh, because I believe the European Union with the UK is in the common interest and uh, it would be a stronger Europe uh, because we need Britain, uh, but uh, at the end it's uh, uh, their decision uh, and we have to accept whatever the outcome will be, but again I hope that it will be a positive pro-European outcome because uh, Europe needs Britain and the other way around. Um, from that point of view, um, I think um, uh, what we need now is uh, also that uh, uh, the transatlantic trade agreement uh, should be brought forward. The worst thing would be to start the process and then the process would collapse because of uh, uh, these dead chickens or whatever on both sides, by the way. Yes. So uh, I think it needs leadership and that's my last point. What I see is a certain crisis of leadership, and I hope we can overcome that. Uh, it needs courage. Uh, by the way, the question there, Europe is not a suicide mission for politicians. It's completely nonsense. I never had the feeling committing suicide by being engaged as a staunch pro-European. I won elections. And the situation today is not very different from my point of view. Mm. Uh, Many politicians are committing suicide. You can read that in the newspaper every day. And uh, uh, especially now in the European crisis, uh, governments are changing uh, dramatically fast. So uh, from that point of view, I think it's a complete wrong perception that uh, it's um, um, a suicide mission. Just the opposite. I think if the Europeans will see someone who has a strategic vision and the power to lead, I think, and if this person, he or she, will not think about re-election, but think about to do the right things for Europe, and it means also for their own country, their own nation, at the end, and this wouldn't be a miracle, he or she will be re-elected. But one thing is quite, quite clear, if, the European, if Europe will unravel, disintegrate, and mm -hmm. renationalize, then those who are responsible have no political future any longer. Thank you. Thank you very much. This nasty little element here on the podium tells us that time is up and that we're actually have, uh, we have uh, consumed already basically the entire coffee break Good. that was scheduled for this. Um, you have indicated that you don't want to come no, Just to say more? thank you. Sure. No, that's exactly <laughs> what I want to say. Um, thank you very much. Thank you a lot for giving us a lot of homework to do. Uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, and uh, it was a great exercise. Thank you.